So good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, thanks uh, first to the organizers for the invitation. It's a very moving uh, time to be here with you. And uh, yeah, well, so, you know, there is the question, I mean, for, for whom is this talk? I mean, in general, it's a question one should ask oneself at every conference. But, uh, you know, it, you know I, I thought about it. And, uh, well, if, if it was uh, someone's real, uh, some real person's birthday, at the very least, that person should understand the talk. But since it's the easing model, it's not clear, you know. Well, I don't know. I hope the easing model will understand my talk. But uh, somehow I will make a very, you know, a simplifying assumption, which is, as all simplifying assumptions, wrong. Uh, which is that you're either a little bit familiar with the FK model, SLE, and things like that, or that you're a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> or both, huh? it's fine. I mean, uh, so, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, there were a number of talks about uh, FK, SLE, and all that. So, I'm going to go, you know, maybe a bit fast about this because I want to tell you about the old things and the new things. So, uh, that's a number of things. So, yeah. Okay, but that said, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, I'll try to give uh, convincing and concise answers as much as I can. All right, so, uh, you know, the easing model is the same uh, model as uh, in the, all, all the other talks. Uh, we are considering a domain, we discretize the domain. Uh, we denote by delta the mesh size. And um, yeah, we wonder as often what happens as the mesh size gets small. So, uh, well, as you know, there is a phase transition. Uh, depending on beta, you see a drastically different picture, which can be made uh, simple and quantitative, say, with the onzager yang formula, which tells you, uh, uh, you know, what is the uh, magnetization in the delta goes to zero limit. So, namely, as delta goes to zero, you tend to either zero if you're lower or equal to beta critical, where beta is the intensity to strength, the inverse temperature, or you go to something non-zero if beta is bigger than beta critical. So something that, you know, Onzaga probably knew, but, you know, couldn't write, quite prove, and that's the first thing I want to start with today, it's that uh, this magnetization was going to zero indeed uh, with the mesh size to the power 1 over 8 with a constant. Uh, and, uh, well, that constant hides a lot, you know, a lot of interesting things. So uh, I'm going to review, you know, old conjectures that are not quite conjectures anymore, uh, you know, about what happens precisely at that critical point. Uh, so, uh, well, you, there are many words, you know, uh, well, long, kind of, uh, long range fluctuations, scale invariance, etc. So, well, one thing one can say is uh, that as the mesh size goes to zero, as you kind of look at your model from far away, uh, well, the easing model has, you know, random fields and random curves, as we will see, and these converge to explicit universal conformal in symmetric limits. So universal means independent of the lattice and many other details, as was discussed in Alessandro Stoke. Uh, and uh, conformally symmetric, it means, roughly speaking, that whatever the limit is, if you, you know, consider a conformal mapping, sending one domain to another, uh, the image of that limit on the first domain is equal to the uh, uh, map of the uh, image of the, do uh, of the model on the other domain. All right. So. Uh, Concretely, uh, well, there have been a number of conjectures about, say, the correlations of the spins. So basically, you take in your domain, you take a number of points, uh, well, uh, arbitrary finite number of points. You look at the spins there. You ask what is the correlation, well, with some boundary condition. And what you can see is that it will, it will go to zero, like the mesh size to the power number of points over eight. And if you renormalize that, you should get an explicit formula. Similarly, there were many, you know, a number of other fields. We will discuss this briefly. And they are, were expected to converge to uh, things that were all quite explicit. And that was uh, very uh, interesting, uh, particularly to mathematicians, because there was maybe something to prove. Well, and uh, relatedly, the other uh, picture was that, you know, if you looked at the random curves that the models would generate, and the simplest to show here are the random uh, loops that arise if you consider the boundaries of clusters of spins of one given color. So here I, I drew uh, spins in uh, red and white, and they are plus boundary conditions, so boundaries white, and you know the interfaces, the boundaries between the spin clusters, they, are, they form a collection of loops. And it was conjectured that these loops have a very specific uh, scaling limit, that their law has a very specific scaling limit, 
uh, and that this uh, process would be a process called CLE3, and uh, you know, small advertisement for this website of David Wilson, CLE3.org, uh, which shows you a process that's not constructed at all from the easing model, but that has exactly the same law as the scaling limit of, uh, of the easing model. So in particular, it gives you a number of things that <coughs> Vendelin kind of hinted at. So for instance, the fractal dimension of the boundaries of these clusters is uh, 11 over 8, and the fractal dimensions of what's called the gasket, so basically what is in uh, say the outer cluster once you removed all the loops so the number of spins in a given cluster is uh, of dim scaling dimension 187 over 96. Okay so anyway so these conjectures were all kind of proven and I'm going to go very fast on how you know they were proven uh, but uh, you know just a little bit of, of an overview well the idea was to really you know use fermions I mean fermions were used since basically ever in the easing model like at least uh, 60 uh, years, but uh, somehow with a different twist, with a complex analytic twist, uh, one was able to uh, study a lot of quantities about the critical easing model and to pass them to the scaling limit to get explicit uh, formula. So um, one formulation that turned out to be particularly handy was a formulation that looks particularly cum cumbersome at first sight. Uh, it was to look, uh, you know, first at the, say, low temperature expansion of the model, so you represent the model by its uh, collection of loops describing the interfaces and you kind of deform that collection well that's one way to un you know understand that you're speaking of disorder operators and then uh, you uh, measure the Boltzmann weight of the collection of loops that you should get but you reweigh it by a complex a number uh, which measures the turning uh, of the path uh, from a given point to another given point uh, in your picture. So you sum over all pictures of this kind for fixed uh, starting and end point, say. And you normalize by uh, the low temperature uh, partition function. So, okay, why do you do this and what does this correspond to? I mean, uh, well, for those who know, well, for the physicists, it's just actually a kind of disquise complexified version of product of spin and uh, disorder. Uh, disorder is obvious, well, should be obvious from this picture. So uh, this is a bit the picture that uh, your badges are made of. I'm very embarrassed that <laughs> this was taken, but somehow also uh, happy that you know you, people seem to like that picture. So here it's a you know it's something that illustrates reasonably well this concept of you know paths that start and end uh, in the middle of a domain. So what could they correspond to? Well, uh, they correspond to kind of defects that you could create in a in a twisted easing model. So this is a model with colors that don't de depict plus ones and minus ones anymore. Uh, so here you have complex numbers that are plus or minus something at any given point, and you preserve the constraint that, uh, you know, uh, spins can be either aligned or opposite, uh, but you add the extra uh, topological constraints that around, like some, uh, you know, monodromy points, well, there must be a path that emerges. All right, so, well, that's mostly illustrative. It's, well, it's a nice picture, uh, but okay, so. So if you're a physicist, you probably know about fermions, and uh, you can live uh, with that, knowing that it's just a slightly complexified version of a fermion. All right, so uh, anyway, what do you do with this function once you introduce it? Well, the uh, kind of key observation, which uh, uh, dates back to Merca, then was uh, also uh, studied by Kenyon and Smirnov, and then a lot of people, many more, uh, too many for, to, to cite. Uh, well, a key idea is that at criticality, at the beta critical, uh, this is a discrete holomorphic function and that you can find boundary conditions uh, for this function and you can find uh, that it has an analog of a discrete singularity. So for those who don't know what discrete holomorphic means, you should think of a lattice counterpart of a Cauchy Riemann equation uh, that I don't want to explicit because it's a little bit uh, long. But uh, anyway, so there is some equation of motion in the physics language uh, that is satisfied at the lattice level. Actually, that characterizes criticality and that allows us to understand this function uh, reasonably well. In particular, uh, what we see is first that this function tells us something interesting about our model. So here it tells us, you know, the, uh, if you evaluate at the point z equals a, so you collapse the two points, you get actually essentially the energy density. And the other thing is that this function converges once properly renormalized. So here if you divide by the mesh size, uh, this function f as a function of z will converge to an explicit holomorphic function that solves an explicit boundary value problem uh, and that you can uh, characterize quite well. The convergence is as good as it gets. And uh, well, recently there have been results extending this for various lattices and actually it's, this result is true in a very great generality now. Should cite uh, Chalkak, Idzurov, Mafouf for this. Uh, 
uh, recent result like last year. All right, so once you have proven that your function converges to a, an explicit function, then you can study your explicit function, uh, study its uh, kind of asymptotic development, so in some sense, uh, kind of poor man's OPE, and uh, then you get a coefficient that actually corresponds to the real normalized energy density. All right, so uh, then, uh, you know, this kind of approach could be generalized to study, you know, more non-trivial quantities, which are not local in terms of the fermion, for physicists, uh, and uh, that are the spin correlations. So the, the idea here was to basically generalize this kind of approach. To, instead of studying the energy density, so the product of two adjacent spins, we wanted to study the reweighted energy density, reweighted by a spin, say a spin at A. So if I reweighted this thing by the by a spin at A, I would get the spin at A plus delta. And uh, if I reweighted the partition function by sigma A, I would get expectation of sigma A. So I would get the ratio of a spin and, a, and the spin next to it. So I would get a kind of logarithmic derivative, at least once I renormalize properly. Uh, and that is exactly what was done, and basically it leads us to functions that are not quite function, uh, functions, uh, simple valued functions, they are actually, actually spinners, uh, so they take values on a square root surface. And uh, yeah, we could carry out the complex analysis of this and study uh, well how this function scales. And basically from this kind of information, we were able to pass to the limit a lot of things, and we were able to extract, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, correlation functions for a lot of things. So basically, with this approach I'm, I was telling you, you can get logarithmic derivatives of spin correlations. Then you need to normalize those logarithmic derivatives. That's a separate technique, probabilistic estimate uh, of the kind of FKG, uh, GK, uh, GHS. But OK, once you had all this, you, you get this theorem that's basically the correlation functions, once properly renormalized, converge to an explicit constant uh, uh, times uh, an explicit uh, Formula. And this explicit formula was predicted by conformal field theory, even though our, our approach at priori had not much to do with conformal field theory. Uh, well, uh, you know, I wrote some uh, examples of this formula. So the one point function, the thing that, uh, you know, came at the beginning of the talk, is basically the inverse of the conformal radius to the power 1 over 8. So uh, basically, the closer you are to the domain with plus boundary condition, the bigger this is. Unsurprisingly, that blows up like 1 over the distance to the boundary to the power 1 over 8. Uh, I drew, you know, I put this picture of Escher here because it illustrates a little bit uh, some emergent geometry that you can see in simply connected domains. Basically, if you take the product of two spins, you renormalize, you get this two-point function. This two-point function is given in terms of the products of the one-point functions times uh, an interaction term which depends on the hyperbolic distance between the points. And the hyperbolic distance is just the number of fish in this picture. So basically, if you want to understand how this spin and that spin, say, interact, you just count the number of fish in between and the size of the fish uh, at the beginning and the end, and you have a, a good approximation of this. So more generally, we get we got formulas for all the spin correlations. That was actually mentioned in the talk of uh, Alessandro and Raphael yesterday. OK. So uh, yeah, just a word of advertisement for Dima. Uh, uh, Kostya and Remy, this was generalized to all uh, isoradial graphs, and you get the same constant, uh, which is this Gleischer constant that was also mentioned yesterday. All right, so that was the first set of conjectures. Then the other set of conjectures was uh, about the uh, interfaces of the model. And so here, uh, you know, what one looks at is, say you have a boundary condition that generates an interface. So if you have plus, boundary, plus spins on one, and, uh, on one side, minus spins on the other side, then uh, there is an interface, like uh, you know, uh, was discussed this morning, uh, separating uh, spins that have plus one and minus ones. Uh, and uh, okay, you can study the law of this interface again at critical temperature. So uh, yeah, uh, these uh, interfaces were shown to converge to SLE curves. Uh, so in this case, it was a radial SLE curve. In this case, it was a so-called dipolar SLE curve. So if you added three boundary conditions, why this was interesting, uh, well will appear in the next slide. But okay, basically the idea was, you know, there are two steps. One is a pre-compactness step, which now works for, uh, you know, many models. Uh, it's just to make sure that your curves are not getting too crazy as you pass to the limit. The second is to really identify those non-crazy limits as being something explicit. And here technique is a martingale uh, identification technique. So basically you keep track of what one calls an observable. So you observe, say, a spin uh, in the middle, uh, you know, in the middle of the domain, mm -hmm. and you look at it at its expectation, knowing the information that the curve is, uh, has grown up to some point. So as the curve grows, you get more and more ideas of whether the spin is plus one or minus, but it remains an uncertain thing. If you average this uncertainty, what you get is a martingale. 
Okay, so uh, it's in, in physical terms, it's a stochastically conserved quantity. So basically, this quantity can be explicitly computed in the scaling limit because knowing that there is a big bit of the interface is, uh, is just knowing something about your domain because your interface just tells that you have minus spins on the left and plus spins on the right. So basically, you can compute the explicit limit of this, and using that explicit limit, you can uh, determine, uh, actually, you can invert the process and determine what is, how the curve must wiggle in order for this to be a martingale. And there's only kind of one way you can wiggle, and it gives you an SLE curve. More precisely, it gives you an SLE tree curve. And okay, in this case, with three boundary conditions, we found that it gives a so-called dipolar SLE, which is a variant of this multiple, uh, this, uh, uh, SLE Caparo multiple SLE that was discussed by Evelina uh, yesterday. All right, so now there is a question, okay, you want to discuss maybe all the, collection, all, all the collections of the loops, and that was a question that came in Wendelin's talk, uh, and how do you catch all the loops? Uh, and, uh, okay, one solution to this problem is to actually uh, use a little twist, so start with an easier question, so free boundary conditions. So you have, uh, you know, not only loops, but also arcs that touch the boundary, and so those, you have a good hope to catch uh, if you understand the easing model with plus, minus, and free boundary conditions, because as you grow one of these loops, you have plus, minus on, on, both ends, uh, on both sides of the curve and free elsewhere. So basically, you've got some kind of process that kind of lurks around on the boundary and kind of catches these arcs whenever it's possible. You can extract the law of these arcs. Once you have these arcs, there's a trick which is to use this FK model that Evelina spoke about yesterday, and Vendelina as well. So basically, the easing model can be coupled with this random cluster model uh, in a way that basically, uh, well, uh, the FK model representing the easing model is, 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 uh, has so-called wired boundary conditions. I'll come back to that in, you know, in 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, conditionally on the outermost loops interfaces of this FK model, I'll come back to what these are a bit later, uh, the inside of the easing model has free boundary conditions. So basically you're back to this situation if you uh, conditionally on the uh, FK loops. So now the FK loops, you can actually catch them by a separate process. Uh, and uh, you catch them because they touch the boundary. And so if you lurk around enough on the boundary, you will kind of catch the FK loops. You need another kind of way to identify those loops, uh, but uh, you can, okay? So uh, basically that's how we got the identification of all the loops of the easing model. And okay, that's, uh, uh, that's something that is uh, also this kind of, uh, you know, objects now, uh, you know, there are people looking at the XOR easing model and they have nice results about that. So, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that, that's a kind of things. All right, so then, uh, you know, we started wondering about what is conformal field theory, actually. And, uh, yeah, actually, I was there. Fairly early on, I bought the book of uh, Giuseppe Musardo, who gave a talk this morning. And... Uh, Believe it or not, it was the easiest thing I could ever find about the field. <laughs> and actually, uh, yeah, uh, that's how I started understanding a bit uh, this. Then, you know, uh, 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 I could read the papers and all that. So, okay, you know, very naively, uh, CFT, uh, how it works. Like, very, and we, uh, you know, informally, now we're writing a book about this. So if you want to uh, get a draft, just write to me. But, you know, if you start from a critical lattice model, like the easing model, how do you get correlation functions that were predicted before. So uh, basically the idea is that there is a kind of space of fields, so you have to explain what is a space of fields. Uh, the, in this space of fields, well, you know, the fields you know, are capturing whatever you are looking at, the spin, the energy, things like that, so local quantities. In this space of field, there's one special field, it's called the stress tensor, and uh, the geometric modes of this uh, modification, no, the, the stress tensor corresponds to you know, how your model is going to respond to geometric modifications. Uh, and basically, if you change the geometry of your domain, the measure is going to change. And if you do it locally, it's going to be local, and there's going to be this uh, stress tensor. Uh, now, uh, the conformal symmetry can be translated into the fact that the stress tensor is holomorphic. And so it means that its correlations are holomorphic functions. If its correlations are holomorphic, you can look at you know, the stress tensor acting on other fields. It kind of dances around them, and you get these uh, modes. And the modes satisfy and that's universal, it doesn't depend on your model, uh, the, the so-called uh, Virasso uh, relations. And uh, basically, then it, you know, it boils down to studying the right representations of the Virasso algebra for 
understanding your model. <coughs> and so, uh, well, then there's uh, this unitarity, which was discussed a bit in Wendelin's talk. Uh, the, uh, so if you have a reflection positive uh, model, then uh, if basically it has a symmetric transfer matrix, then uh, you have this self adjointness property with respect to a certain bilinear form. And basically, if you, you want uh, your parameter C to be less than one, and that you know, needs to be explained, but okay, uh, and you want unitarity, there's only a kind of discrete list of models of, uh, out of which the first is, corresponds to the easing model. And the next one corresponds to the tricritical easing model that was discussed today, uh, uh, this morning by Giuseppe and will be discussed later. M5 is the three pods, I mean, contains the three pods, etc. Okay, anyway, so in these models, you have degeneracies of the representations, and once you have the de de degeneracies of the representations, you translate this in terms of the stress tensor, and then you get some, uh, well, PDs for correlation functions. Okay, so that's like going very fast. I'm not going to speak too much about CFT. Generally speaking, I'm going to focus on specific examples. But, but you know, enough to say that we started like looking at uh, like lattice counterparts of the CFT quantities. And okay, one simple uh, message I can send is, you know, there is a space that works at least very well for the easing model. Uh, it's a space of what, you know, we call lattice local fields. So basically anything that you can compute at any point that depends on a finite radius uh, uh, of, of spins within a fi finite radius, uh, well, uh, is going to be a lattice local field. So the product of two adjacent spins is a lattice local field. The Laplacian of the spin is a discrete Laplacian of the spin is a local field, and so on and so forth. And there was th this conjecture that one can make is that basically each lattice local field that is non-zero can be renormalized in a way uh, that it converges to some continuous CFT field. So this conjecture, you know, sounds a little bit, you know, abstract and all that, but it's kind of partially proven in the sense that combining works uh, of these people, uh, in particular this uh, result that we had, where we found at the lattice level the Viras, you know, the exact Virasu algebra, a bit of a surprise of those people who knew that. So basically at the lattice level, the discrete holomorphicity, all this stuff I explained to you, is enough to reconstruct the whole Virasu algebra already at the lattice level. Using this result, one can basically show that for any field, at least of the, of the easing model in the continuous limit, there is an explicit lattice counterpart. Actually, there's an infinite number of explicit lattice counterparts, uh, but you can identify, uh, well, quite a lot of them. So basically, one knows basically this uh, map is surjective. Sorry, yeah. so is your construction of, of the Virasu algebra from the lattice related to the Kusser construction? No, it's not, because that's not an exact one. So it's a completely different one. Uh, but it's, it's, it's nice, it acts on the space of fields, really, not on the transfer matrix state space. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, well, the paper is, is, uh, is on the archive. And uh, yeah, I couldn't believe it works, but it works. Like, I checked like maybe 10 times, it still works. But okay, it's not a proof that it works, right? But it's, but like the the, the proof seems, seems solid. So yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so it was a bit surprising because, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a miracle, right? Like, you know, one one expects that this discrete holomorphicity contains the roots of conformal symmetry, which in itself is uh, Virasu algebra, but that at the lattice level, this uh, lattice relations contain in themselves the exact Virasu algebra without any kind of and, you know, without giving, giving up anything is a bit surprising, but it's true. Okay, well, anyway. No, so now I want to tell uh, for, <laughs> so basically this is for my friends, but there's a lot of friends here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, things that are a bit newer than this. Uh, and so there are, you know, there's no theorem, they're just heuristic results, but I think that they are very plausible and hopefully interesting. Uh, and yeah, so maybe maybe now I'll, I will slow down a little bit, and uh, yeah. So this is about the easing model, also a bit about the tricritical easing model. It's definitely about duality. It's definitely about CFT. It's, and you know, the, the way to make these into theorems would be using SLE. Okay. So I'll tell you a little bit what I thought about, uh, and uh, yeah. So. The idea uh, for this talk is going to rely on parafermionic correlators and observables. Uh, so I'll first have to explain a little bit what these guys are. And then uh, I want to explain to you how this tells us something about the tricritical easing model and supersymmetry, which was like hinted at in the talk of Giuseppe. And then I want to tell you something a little bit more uh, kind of speculative, but I think uh, quite reasonable about duality defect lines and Carroll fields. 
Okay, in particular, so I promised new pictures, uh, the, you know, uh, so this is a new picture of one model. This is one model uh, with two kind of, you know, you can, uh, most people are not tetrachromic in their vision. So I want, I would have wanted to superimpose these two pictures so that you can see something. Uh, you know, maybe you need some special glasses or something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so basically uh, I will explain to you what this is, but that's just one sample of a twisted tricritical eating model, okay? So hopefully uh, by the end of the talk, yeah, you know what I drew here. So yeah, that's for the promise that there will be new pictures. Actually, I will show you a simulation. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, now I have to explain to you a few things a bit quickly because uh, yeah, many of you know about this, but okay. Uh, still, I have to explain a bit. So uh, there's this loop ON model, which is not quite the original Heisenberg ON model. It's a model of loops that live on a lattice. For simplification, we're going to think of the honeycomb lattice because I want to have a trivalent lattice that has symmetry. And uh, so, yeah, the probability of a configuration of loop is proportional to the number of, uh, to a, a parameter called n, which is a, a positive uh, number, a real number, uh, to the number of loops, and a parameter x, uh, which is also a positive number, to the number of edges. x is like, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, it's like the, uh, it's, it's close to exponential of minus uh, temperature or something like that. All right, so uh, for these models, there's not many like uh, rigorous results about the scaling limits, uh, but uh, still uh, conjecturally, there's this idea that uh, if you take n between zero and two, say strictly for being careful, uh, you have two uh, possible scaling limits. There's a dilute regime where x is a x critical, it's a fairly small number in some sense, uh, and that it converges to CLD uh, kappa for kappa between uh, uh, eight thirds and four. That's what the Wendelin spoke about in his talk. Uh, and there's a dense regime. Whenever X is bigger than this X critical, uh, then uh, you should converge to a CLE kappa with a kappa value that is between four and eight. So, uh, so curves that kind of, uh, kind of touch each other, touch the boundary, like these FK guys. So, okay, this conjecture is not proven. It's consistent with the works of Miller and Werner, as was explained in Wendelin's talk. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just for the sake of uh, concreteness and for later, I, you know, typically, if we want to see an SLE curve, not a CLE, but an SLE, what you should do is you should fix a marked point on the boundary and maybe a marked point in the bulk or on the boundary and look at the con collections of pictures with loops weigh them exactly the same way, but on top of the picture of loops, have a path that is allowed to go from A to B, say. And that, in the scaling limit, should converge, that curve should converge to radial SLE or chordal SLE if the point is on the boundary. So okay. what if X is exactly equal to critical X? You said what happens. But you, you and X large, right? No, well, uh, no, for X equal X critical, uh, it's this dilute. For X less than X critical, uh, there's, there's, you know, no loop. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, it's either x equal or x large. Ah. Yes, if x equals x critical, it's dilute, and if x is bigger than x critical, it's dense. <laughs> so you convert to this branch. There's these branches. So, for this is a, uh, you know, as a function of n, n from zero to two. That's the dilute branch. N from, uh, from <laughs> n from zero to two. That's the dense branch. Why do we never talk about x equals infinity? Well, well, I mean, I just wanted to, uh, you know, limit the number of problems because I'm not going to talk about x big anyway in this talk. But it's not like I never talk about it. I mean, I just, uh, I mean, I'm not try deliberately trying to avoid this. I'm just like uh, trying to, you know, bring statements that don't get people to think in the wrong direction. I mean, I'm not saying that it's a wrong research direction. It's just for this, the purpose of this talk, it's not, it's the wrong uh, direction, actually. Okay. But so it, it, there's nothing bad about, you know, nothing wrong. Yeah, about there's it. the right formulation of the question is, would, would you have something to say about it? But maybe later. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, myself at this point, no, but nothing, uh, yeah, no, nothing very intelligent, but okay, uh, you know. Okay, uh, it's, it's, not, it's definitely not a bad question. I mean, from the point of view of integrability. From the point of view of SLE, it doesn't really, you know, that's, I want to talk about stuff that, you know, could ultimately be proven with SLE. And that's, your question will be an integrability question. I mean, in some sense, there, there, will, there will be so, something related to, yeah, exactly solvable models. But okay, anyway, 
So, uh, so that's one of the class of models. The other class is the FK model, which you are a bit more familiar with because it's been, at least you've been exposed to it quite a lot uh, in the last uh, two days. But okay, so you know, there are these edges that are either here or not here. Uh, and there's a queue to the number of clusters formed by the edges in a given graph. That the Ising model uh, comes from a DFK model with Q equals 2 and that you can sample uh, was all explained in Wendelin's talk. That plus boundary conditions co co correspond to wired boundary conditions is exactly what I used to discuss the CLE. And uh, basically, uh, you know, for every FK model on a planar graph, there's a dual FK model uh, where basically the edges of the dual are here when the edges of the primal are not here and vice versa. So here, uh, you know, in green, you have the primal, uh, primal uh, FK configuration. In, uh, in pink, you have a dual. And uh, in between, you, the, you have this blue uh, collection of loops that separates primal from dual. So basically, you can describe, of course, the configuration uh, here uh, in terms of the loops. And at the self-dual point, which happens to be the critical point, as was proven uh, some time ago, by Beferrand, de Milito, Vincent, and Hugo, uh, then you get a probability of of uh, configuration that is proportional to just square root of Q to the number of loops. Well, this was more proven to be rotational invariant in some sense. Okay, so uh, anyway, here you also have conjectures that this converges to SLE, right? And, uh, and CLE, and basically the CLEs are exactly the same as the ones of the, of the o, uh, ON model uh, in, the di in the dense phase where N takes the role of uh, uh, well, a, 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 n equals square root of q. Okay, So uh, this is not surprising in some sense, because in both cases, you have a model where basically the loops will fall, fill most of the space. Well, in the case of fk, they will fill the whole space that is available on, you know, for them. And uh, basically, then you just take this. So in some sense, it would be an infinity x on a, step on a different graph. So it's not surprising that basically the FK model looks in the scaling limit conjecturally like the ON model, but still, you know, I think one can do something with that observation. Okay, so uh, now just a very quick summary about the CFT things, so that we can focus on what we want. So you know, conjecture. You know, as I told you before, there's this uh, sequence of minimal models of CFT, which conjecturally correspond to nice lattice models. So that's basically what our book is about. Uh, so m equals 2 is you know, a bit degenerate. You could say it's percolation for the sake of completeness here, but it's actually it's not quite true because in terms of CFT, it's not quite true. In terms of SLE, it's completely true. Uh, uh, so m equals 3 is the Ising model. So it corresponds to several of these models I discussed before. So it corresponds to this O n model dilute with n equals 1. It corresponds to this O square root of 2 dense. And it corresponds to fk q equals 2. Like the track critical easing model corresponds to O square root of 2 dilute, O of the golden, uh, golden mean uh, thing uh, dense, fk of the square of that thing. Uh, okay. Then you have three parts and track critical three parts and, and things like that. Okay, but so, uh, you know, what I will exploit a bit in the talk is this connection between dilute and dense, which I think maybe is a bit overlooked. Uh, you know, there's this paper of Cardin Musardo, I think, of the flow between minimal models. It's definitely related to, to that. So basically, uh, you know, minimal models that are adjacent are related to one another by a dilute dense connection of a sort. Well, of course... That all minimal models are realized by ON models with n between... Well, uh, but, you know, they correspond to SLE curves and all these SLE curves correspond to, <laughs> to some ON models. So it's not even so surprising in some sense, conjecturally, right? Uh, you just for the one models you just need c to be bigger than zero, which is the case of all minimal models. So it's not even a very strong statement, right? I think the statement is very. I mean, physicists would not agree because what you call, oh. I mean, there might be some observables which have the same scaling dimension and so on, but the spectrum of local operators. No, okay, a hundred percent agrees. So, so, so this is about the random curves. A hundred percent agreed. Okay, so, 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 so it's a nice picture, but I will get something. I will get to something that that you will agree with, probably, hopefully. But uh, no, so, so this is not about the somehow. Yeah, it's a bit misleading in some sense. It's not about the CFT. It's more more about the random curves. Conjecturally, again, you know, I want to do just purely conjectural things to, in the end, tell you something that I think could be uh, made sense of rigorously. Okay. Anyway, so you know the Ising model because this is what this conference is about. But the tricritical critical Ising model, well. 
Yeah, you will know a bit because uh, that's what uh, Giuseppe spoke about, actually. So there are many formulations. First, it's not really a model. <laughs> that's the first uh, thing you should know about the track critical easing model. The, the, if there is a lattice model, it's, you know, it's either an ADE model or a bloom couple model. So one way to present this is to say that spins are either zero or plus minus one, uh, as was very well explained by Giuseppe. You know, zero, you think that just the spin is not there. And if it's there, it interacts like an easing model spin. So basically, the spins that are left, they interact like easing model spins. But uh, you know, they don't necessarily want to be here. And you can force them to be here by introducing a chemical potential to kind of force them to be here or not here. So this is the kind of a twisted version of the diagram that he showed, Giuseppe. Uh, so basically, if you, if you uh, force the spins to be here, you will have an easing-like phase transition. If you allow them to kind of really not be here, you will have a discontinuous phase transition. I don't think it's proven, but okay, we believe. Uh, and at the end of the easing line, there is a point. That's the tricritical point. It's called tricritical because there could be more parameters in that thing, like I was explaining in Giuseppe's talk. And it's when they are all like uh, at the right point that you have the tricritical model. So, okay, this is a simulation of uh, the tricritical easing model with, with uh, zero spins being in black and uh, plus ones being uh, gray and minus ones <laughs> being white. Okay. So, okay, this is a bit how it looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, can, can we do something interesting with that? So, one thing when it. Well, uh, black is a zero, so absent, uh -huh. and uh, plus one is, uh, say, gray, and minus one is white. Well, I mean, I, either way, but, but uh, yeah, there's no, like, uh, the, uh, it's not, like, there are boundary conditions, but I, I kind of took a crop, so you should think that this is a window on a bigger picture. Uh, so, no particular boundary conditions here, uh, for what I remember. But, uh, okay, anyway, and, you know, the first thing you can observe, like, numerically, and it's kind of reliably <laughs> true, and, well, then we can make sense of it, but uh, first it was a numerical observation, that basically at this tricritical point of the bloom couple model, you know, it's not like what one has, would have expected first, maybe. The plus one spins and the minus one spins, they don't really like to be next to one another. I mean, it's maybe not surprising, but they really hate each other. So, like, the, you, you will never see a big cluster of plus one next to a big cluster of minus one. Right. So basically, there are just these zeros that play the role of buffer zones between plus ones and minus one. So actually, it's pretty simple in some sense. Uh, I'm always surprised that you know, if you search into Google, try critical easing model, bloom couple, you never see a single simulation on Google image. But OK, if, if people <laughs> had done simulations or at least showed, shown the pictures, they would have seen them. Right? Uh, actually, I found one physics paper that kind of just mentions that somewhere. But uh, yeah, it's not so wow. well known. May I ask a stupid question? <coughs> In your simulation, it looks like the union of plus one and minus one clusters is not even connected. Is it true? Yeah, it's not connected. No, because there's a kind of zero gasket. There's a zero gasket. Yes, so that's be below the percolation threshold, right? Uh, well, I mean, okay, that simulation could be. No, I, th I think it's it's quite accurate. No, it's just. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the, it's true that the okay. Well, you know, it's what you said is true, and I, I, I would not say that it's built. It's crit It's kind of still critical, with you know, uh, in that sense. You know. Basically, uh, the, this this gasket is a is a Swiss cheese. Okay, that's it. Oh well, of course, for those people who live in Switzerland, they know that it's not a Swiss cheese. But. If you believe that the three vacua structure also survive at the critical point in some scale, uh -huh. then you have possibility of kink zero one. Yeah. Zero, minus one, but not one, one. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So this is right. always a reflection of this. Yeah. Uh, another way to say this, I mean, I could have written what you said, but another way to say this is that there is also some lattice, uh, other lattice models than bloom couple where uh, it's called RSOS or ADA models, where the spins take values on a Dinkin diagram, and they're really forced to take, you know, the n n n so the Dinkin diagram has three vertices like this. So this is zero, one, and minus one, and just plus one is never allowed to be next to minus one, and that's it. You can either forbid it explicitly or uh, see that appear spontaneously. Well, but okay, anyway, so that's an observation. But I, you know, I, I want a bit more than just this observation. I want to build a picture that is consistent with that observation. And uh, in hindsight, you will think, oh yeah, obvi obviously it was like that. Hopefully, uh, you agree with me at the end of the talk. So, so we should think of this tricritical easing model, which again is not really a model, it's just a tri tri tricritical point of the bloom couple here, as being, you know, uh, what? What did I think? So, uh, 
I, I will I will promote the following picture. So basically, these loops are like dilute O square root of two loops. And conditionally on the loops, obviously, inside uh, the loops, where you tell that it's uh, plus one or minus one, the fact that it's plus one or that's minus one, it's a symmetric thing. So it's like you toss a coin, right, for for what is inside the loops. And so it's a kind of dilute FK model in some sense, uh, which, which you would sample with a plus minus one percolation. So then you could construct, I mean, that's something that, you know, if people who are interested could try to do, because they, then uh, we'll like, provide some, some hints of, of things you could say about this. You could do the construction that was done by Camille Gerborn Newman on CLE uh, 16 five over five, or, or instead of CD 16 over three, and you would get, I claim, exactly this spin field of the tricritical model in the scaling limit. So can we support this picture and study it? Yes, we can, but I need to tell you about power fermions, which was the point of this talk. <laughs> so I need uh, three more slides about power fermions. Okay, um, so power fermions, you know, first, uh, you know, uh, the first name that comes to my mind is Ninhaus. Then they were uh, kind of modified and popularized by Smirnov for mathematicians. And then, uh, yeah, Hugo and Stas proved something about uh, the stealth avoiding work. And then there was a lot of, a lot more of parafermions after that. But okay, there are kind of modifications of these fermions that, of the easing model that I spoke about at the beginning. So they are singled out in the framework that Smirnov introduced by the fact that they satisfy lattice cauchy riemann equations. So, you know, you can choose parameters, but basically what fixes parameters is you want uh, a partial cauchy riemann equation, which, you know, from an analytical point of view is not enough to prove convergence, but is still a pretty good way to choose parameters. So, uh, yeah, okay, so, you know, there are two types of observables. There are FK observables and ON observables. I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about both. So let's start with FK this time. So for FK, basically, these are of this form. If you're a mathematician, you recognize this, maybe, if, because if you, if you read this FK papers. So it's basically an expectation of the, an indicator function that are, an interface that you generate from boundary condition passes through a point, and then you complexify it, you weigh it by, you reweigh it by a, a winding number a quantity. So basically, how much the curve of the interface has turned uh, multiplied by a spin a sigma, which is a, a sigma here is not the easing spin, it's a parameter, it's a real positive parameter. Uh, that uh, needs to be tuned. And basically, it can be tuned in such a way uh, that uh, if you choose uh, uh, the, the spin such that 2 cosine of the spin is square root of q, uh, it will satisfy this half of cauchy riemann equation, which suggests that conjecturally, at least, it should converge to a continuous quantity, which you can characterize explicitly. So this is a big problem. No one knows how to prove it, but everyone kind of believes that it's true in some generality. And you, you just said, so this is uh, discrete holomorphic yeah. for any Q? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's actually a way, a way to, to characterize the critical point. Actually, that could be used to characterize the critical point rigorously and even study uh, yeah, things about it. Yeah, Hugo and uh, Johan and other people did cool things about that. Uh, but okay, so you know, if you had this proof, the proof that it converges, you could identify the scaling limit of the, F the FK models. And uh, yeah, all the things I told you for Q equals two would work as well. Now that you have this- What's, yeah. what's missing then? The convergence of the function. You know, the, fu the function, uh, you know, uh, could converge, but also could not converge, right? Yeah, but what's special about Q equal two for- Well, the, the relations are stronger. They allow you to characterize, uh, the, basically the there's a unique solution to the discrete boundary value problem. So, and uh, you have a lot of techniques. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a very non-trivial problem. It looks like, it looked maybe 10 years ago that it was kind of close. We were close to getting this, but it doesn't look like uh, we, are get, we are much closer <laughs> to proving this observable convergence. Okay. There's a similar story for the parafermionic observable, but it's a bit more subtle. Questions? No. Uh, because uh, basically there are two uh, points at which, uh, two integrability points, two points at which you have this half of cauchy riemann equation. So there's the critical value of x, for which there is a special value of a spin, uh, so uh, where uh, basically things work. So basically the, F, the ON observable is, is a, a twisted version of this thing I introduced for the easing model before. So, you know, uh, x to the number of, of, of loops, but you add a path on, on top of the loops, then you have the same uh, weight, and then you have a complex weight which measures how this extra path turns. So, there's a critical point 
uh, that's, the critical point can be identified in this way in some sense uh, and there is a special spin and then there's, there, there's another point which is bigger than critical so conjecturally we'll converge to the same scaling limit as all the x bigger than x critical but it's a special integrability point which I call x dense uh, where you have this thing that is partially holomorphic and it should converge to something with a different spin and so if you had this convergence again uh, you would have the convergence of a um, lot of things like self-avoiding work and all the ON interfaces and loops but okay we don't have that so let's just single out the points of interest here so easing you have uh, the, 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 the guy I told you about at the beginning was this, the fermion and so it corresponds to ON dilute with sigma equals one half the easing model can also be written as O and dense in the scaling limit conjecturally with sigma equals 1 over 16. There's this FK thing that you, you know, I didn't speak about, but we used. And uh, there's a, one more guide I'm, I'm going to tell you about, in, in, you know, later. And uh, the track critical, you know, you get some, something of this sort. So, uh, you know, maybe I want to add something here. Let's take a step back. So I said the FK model, you know, you have this convergence. So if we think, what did we have? So we have the ON models. There's a dilute and a dense phase. There are spins, observables, and all that. And so dilute is less than kappa less than 4. Dense is kappa bigger than 4. It's quite nice. FK, for some reason, there's only the kappa bigger than 4 region, right? Uh, it's like the dense ON. But there's no dilute FK in some sense. Well. I think I claim that track critical is a kind of looks like it, you know, it calls for a kind of dilute FK. But okay, uh, so something that can be observed that is, you know, these these observables and all that, you know, we don't know that they converge. But of course, the limiting SLE, the conjectural scaling limits, they, you know, they're compatible with these things. So we, from SLE, you can, in principle. Uh, kind of construct something like that that is holomorphic, continuous holomorphic, and all that. And that works for any kappa bigger than 4, but you could actually analytically continue that uh, quantity to kappa less than 4, and it works perfectly. You have a holomorphic function that is a martingale with respect to SLE. It corresponds to a complexified version of the kind of uh, visit probability. On the boundary, it's actually the visit probability, renormalized visit probability. And yeah, you could do, you could, cons you can, like a dream that there is a kind of analytic continuation, at least in the continuous world, there is an analytic continuation of these guys to the dilute FK regime. So that's interesting because somehow, uh, if you dream that these things exist, then for the tricritical easing model, th that guy would have spin three halves, and we will see that it's probably related to supersymmetry. So, okay. so, so here, because there were some questions several yeah. times already about analytic continuations, yeah. and so far they were all refused on the grounds that this is just due to the realistic measure and so on. Here you are okay with analytic continuations? Well, uh, so I, in the limit, the analytic continuations should be as probabilistic as these observables are, which is like quite probabilistic. But so you don't want to consider actually complex cup. <laughs> Okay, so unless there was a very good reason to do so, I would rather not do so. Okay. <laughs> no, there is a very good reason, yeah. But, uh, I, okay, I, I, I can say, okay, I, to answer your question, so somehow, you know, I don't know how to continue analytically these FK observables, but basically, at the tr if you go to the tricritical, the point of FK corresponding to the tricritical easing, which would be the dilute FK square uh, with parameter 2, the spin of the observable would, ha would be three halves, and it could be, in principle, possible to show convergence of this guy. And I think if one had to give up probability uh, <laughs> measure to gain, uh, you know, holo discrete holomorphicity, it would be a worthwhile trade-off. But that's speculative. Okay, so let's say that we refuse it until with the day uh, some someone kind of comes with convincing arguments why we should look at analytic continuations. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, let me try to make sense of the whole picture. I, I don't know. Okay, just a side note. That's something I never quite understood, right? Uh, but it, it's, it's, that's for, 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 you know, well, most of my friends know about this observation, but still. So if you collapsed this wired arc of the FK model, so basically, you know, it's an interface between wired and free. So if you just made wired just one point, then uh, actually the not so surprisingly, perhaps, but the FK and the ON observables are exactly the same, identically the same at the lattice level. 
In the scaling limit, the corresponding things are of course the same at the q equals 2, but you could extend it around it, around the point q equals 2 and around the point n equals 1. So you could have fine match between, between uh, you know, two pairs of correlators for models that are not in the same, same uh, universality class. And I don't understand what this means, and I don't know if it's true on the lattice level that they are equal or not. I can say in the limit, the, the scaling limits of these things should be the same, and it's a bit mysterious. Okay, so maybe that's also worth exploring. So yeah, a brief word about supersymmetry in fermions. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details because this, this is still in writing, and yeah. But uh, basically, if you uh, believe, you know, okay, I don't know what is the right lattice model for tricritical, but the, the limit I know, it should be described in terms of SLE 16 over 5 and all that. So you, if you could construct analogs of the FK observable for SLE 16 over 5. And there you would have spin 3 halves, like you would, have, you ex would expect the G fermion to, to look like. And basically, you should just construct the easy model uh, fermion in terms of the FK model and generalize the construction to <coughs> the dilute FK in the scaling limit, because if you want to have the correct model. And so, uh, yeah, so this way you could, you know, almost really construct the G. And then what you would you do with this G? Well, you could uh, connect, uh, construct all these correlators in terms of CD16 over 5. You could get explicit formulas for this. Actually, surprisingly, you know, we couldn't find in physics uh, explicit formulas for this, but Frank uh, managed to get explicit formulas for, for G on the basis that it satisfies the physics axioms. Okay. Uh, and we, we, we would understand how G, you know, we, we should try to understand how G exchanges bosons and fermions. And we could do, maybe more excitingly, uh, you know, construct like uh, versions of the spinners, replacing the psi of the easing with the G, and try to compute spin correlations over that. So up to two points, it kind of works. Uh, more than two points, it, you know, it looks like a very tough problem. But, you know, conceivably, one could like compute this, the correlators of the CLE 16 over 5 spin field, based spin field, uh, using uh, you know, a trick similar to the one used for easing. Well, okay, I don't know how to make that work, but that's, that's an idea. And uh, yeah, uh, okay, so yeah, that, that's the remark I said. Basically, on the lattice level, if there was an analytic continuation, I have no idea how to do it, you could have some kind of strong holomorphicity at the spin equal three halves because these half integer things are a bit better than the non half integer things. So easing is special also because it has half integer. So this is also half integer. So maybe something works. Again, this is all maybes, uh, but okay. Now I want to tell you about some, you know, maybe uh, more specul speculative maybes, but are actually quite cool because not many people have thought about them. So. <laughs> I will tell you later why I started thinking about this, but uh, basically I started thinking about duality and defect lines. So uh, maybe it's fashionable in some fields of physics, but I have not really heard people in math speak about that. So, you know, what is a defect line? Naively, it's something wh when you cross uh, uh, that line, a plus becomes minus and vice versa. Across that line, a plus is seen as minus and vice versa. Can you do something, you know? A bit crazier, basically, why, why, why are these interesting? Because they correspond to plus minus boundary conditions. What are the other types of boundary conditions? FK boundary conditions, wired free. So this generates an interface. So what if you had something that across which, you know, if you cross it, wired becomes free and, and or primal becomes dual and vice versa. Is it possible to do something like that? And then I had this idea and then I realized actually some people in physics, uh, As and Monk Fenley, had written papers about that, even though the solutions are not completely satisfactory. They had some kind of attempts recently, like in the last five years, to do things like that. So duality defects should be two uh, usual disorders, uh, uh, you know, the, the analog, but instead of replacing plus minus, uh, plus by minus, you would replace plus by free or minus by free and vice versa. Can we do, can we make sense of this? Can we construct, say, uh, random uh, mo model whose, whose curves converges to, say, a radial SLE 16 over 3, like for this easing model. Well, I don't know. We tried something with Frank five years ago. It didn't really work, but I will show you a picture because, okay, maybe it's not so visible, but basically it's a, it's, a, it's a modified FK where we took a kind of line. Across half of the line, we just extend the FK, and across the other half of the line, we make the model interact with its dual. So uh, yeah, it's not really clear what is primal and dual anymore with this picture. But uh, yeah, if you have good eyes, you can see that there is a random curve that should arise here. 
Well, that looked like exciting. You know, we're going to prove something that <laughs> didn't work. But I mean, because we didn't really find a very canonical way to define this disorder, uh, this uh, duality disorders. Like all our definitions seem to depend on the choice of the line at the lattice level. Maybe in the limit it doesn't depend anymore, but it's not as beautiful. Uh, we were not excited enough to continue. But maybe there's something to do in that direction. No? Okay, anyway, so uh, then last summer I had an idea. So uh, <coughs> it was, uh, yeah, uh, that's, you know, for, uh, I, I was trying to do some kind of art project with uh, uh, an easing model and, and I was kind of failing because I wanted to make a clock, for, you know. With these disorders, you know, you can make one hand maybe of a clock that moves, but you can, I, could, I wanted to have two hands because that's how a clock looks like. And I couldn't really do it, and that, then I got some idea. So let me try to tell you about this idea. It's a bit crazy, but who knows. So, uh, you know, so let's think of the tricritical easing model as being sampled by O of square root of two loops, dilute, okay? This is a naive picture, but, you know, we ha I think, I hope that I've convinced you that there is a bit of kind of circumstantial evidence that it, it would really make sense to think of the model this way. Uh, also, yeah, I didn't say, but the gasket dimension of CLE 16 over 5, so the dilute guy, is really the dimension of the spin field like you would have for the CLE 16 over 3, the, di the dense, that is the dimension of the spin field for easing and all that. So there's a lot of evidence that it's kind of the correct picture. But, you know, I thought, okay, so O square root of two loops, fine. Now I want to do like duality disorders. I want to do, uh, you know, something that would generate an interface of, with O square root of two. Well, O square root of two would kind of split plus one from, uh, plus one or minus one from zero, like we explained before. Like, the, you know, there are these loops that separate uh, basically non-zero from zeros, right? Uh, and uh, now, what if you had just a, a, not a loop, but a path? What would this correspond to? Then I thought, started thinking about duality. So basically, here, actually, for this critical easing model, there is the duality is actually nicer even than easing, actually. Because, uh, you know, basically, in the, 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 the correct picture was to think in the islands of zeros, so the spins that are not there, I should think there's a dual model where the spins are there, okay? It's like a bit for FK, but a bit more like localized. People, you know, these two models, they will split the territory, right? Uh, so uh, basically, I should think that within the, uh, the, uh, the, spins, the, the spins that are not there, there's a dual model where the spins are there, and they are plus one or minus one. They choose randomly. So, okay, maybe we should think of a symmetrized model Basically, uh, that would be spontaneously, you know, symmetric with respect to the duality. Basically, duality in the case of tricritical just means the symmetry between spins that are there and not there. Like FK, it's be between, you know, primal model and dual model. Here, it would be between spins that are there and not there. So, when I thought, you know, we can construct a different Hamiltonian, so a model where you have spins that are either in one copy of the, you know, in one copy of the world or spins that are in the other copy of the world. And spins interact only if they're in the same copy of the world. Okay. So I thought about, you know, we can do this. This is spontaneously self-dual. And I think with the right parameter, which I only found numerically, uh, you would have something that looks like the tricritical easing model on one sheet, uh, on one world, and a dual uh, model on the other world. So this is a sample of that. So it's not as easy to read as before. So basically, this is the spin field, but it's not the spin field of the tricritical. To, to know the spin field of tricritical, you should just first choose whether you take pink or blue. And you should say extract all the pink. So once you've chosen, say, I want to take pink. So basically, the spins will be the ones here. It doesn't move. It's just an artifact of the video. Huh? Uh, the, the spins here at the points where you're pink and zero at the points where you're blue. That's one model. And the other model is you take these spins, but only at the places where it's blue and zero where it's pink. Yeah, there's some asymmetry that looks in the picture, but that's just because it's a color artifact. Okay, so if you have this picture, then you can think, <laughs> I want to kind of make duality defect lines. So I want to uh, uh, kind of construct some disorders that uh, split that basically, you want to give up the idea there's a primal model, a dual model. There is a, the idea would be there's a, a line across which the primal corresponds to the dual, or in some sense, you just need to know locally if you are in the same model or not the same model. And you interact only if you're in the same model. So, so this model has only one parameter rather than two. Yeah, but it would only correspond to the tricritical tri point, right? It would not, not correspond to the other phases. Um, 
And uh, yeah, well, okay. So basically, I believe that we can construct some duality disorders, some things that would converge nicely, uh, conjecturally, to uh, radial SLE 16 over 5 and stuff like that. And the idea is that there's this rumor that there's a chiral spin field, so uh, uh, an object that should have scaling dimension 1 over 16, a holomorphic guy. And I believe to construct this guy, we would need something like a duality disorder. Like for the fermion, we needed, needed a disorder to construct the fermion. Uh, maybe using this uh, duality disorders, one could construct a chiral spin field. So that would be for a track critical easing model, which should also have a track uh, chiral spin field of scaling dimension 1 over 16. But maybe the same construction would work for easing. And the reason I wanted to have a chiral spin field is because I read these crazy papers of uh, a school of people who are really not probability people or physics people, just group theory people. And you know, they claim they can construct the moonshine uh, uh, from 48 easing models. So, you know, I tried to understand these papers, I only understood them partially. But my conclusion is that there's no chance that this would work if you didn't have a holomorphic chiral field. Uh, so, uh, okay, so then that's why I started looking at all these things. Okay, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so the moonshine is a CFT with central charge 24, and you're supposed to couple in some, I mean, to, to, to pick fields in 48 easing models uh, that are independent. Huh? Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, people are seriously thinking that the 48 copies of easing model is, is a thing, right? And, uh, yeah, I mean, it could be a thing if you could make sense of this chiral spin, spin field. Okay, and I think that you could make sense of this chiral spin field if you could make sense of duality disorders. And I think that this uh, thing, picture I showed you was a picture of a duality disorder for tricritical. But, okay, this is a bit speculative. Huh? I don't, I don't, no guarantee, but, okay, I, I guarantee that I believe in it. That's my guarantee. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyway, so, you know, easings and fermions, it's a long, long way, but we can still do things with that. Uh, even for critical easing in 2D, I think that's stuff that we don't quite not yet know. And yeah, it would be nice to have new pictures. I'll show you, uh, to finish, I'll just show you uh, a simulation of, of uh, well, it should be smoother, but there's, there's a zoom problem. But basically, that's this track, this track critical uh, model with defects that's kind of running. Uh, and yeah, so you see, it's a real model. It exists. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, it's a general yeah. question. Yeah. Right? At the beginning of your talk, you show how to compute correlation function yeah. using SLA technology. No. Well, uh, you could, you could. Add. That's not what quite, quite what I showed, showed, but you could, yeah. Uh, but this was uh, somehow forced to be at criticality, right? Yeah. So okay. it's a, how to say, synonymous of conformal field theory calculation. Yeah. Now my question is, uh, can you modify the measure of SLE to go away from criticality? For the temperature thing, you can modify these things, and uh, actually, it's more like discrete analysis. Uh, you can, you can, you can, you know, go away from criticality in the temperature direction, and you can really connect nicely with the Sato Miwajimbo theory of isomonodromic perturbation, and you can get plenty of it from that. Easing or in general? No, in easing. No, okay. I'm talking about other things. Well, you can perturb in, you know, some directions, but not all directions. So can okay. you do for critical easing? Well, okay, so we don't even know how to do it on discrete <laughs> level, this track critical easing model. That, that's a problem. But okay, imagining that you could, you would get the, uh, SU, the, the SU2 perturbation that you mentioned. Okay, that's, what, that's the one we would get. You would not get the E7 perturbation. But if it is Bloom coupled, then, then there is a tri tri critical point. There is a tri critical point. That's, that's true. true. But there is, and this, you know. Discrete phase transition. The yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's proven everywhere. Yeah, not up to the critical point, but somehow. <laughs> yeah, at low temperature is proven, but but somehow still it, it's a, it's you know, the thing you know between what we think we know and what we can prove, there's such a huge gap, and so somehow you know you're asking me about this discrete. Uh, so imagine you you could prove that the model converges to. A continuous model. Uh, so imagine that this big conjecture was proven. Then, which direction could you move uh, away from and keep the holomorphicity? I think this this is the 
kind of simpler integrable perturbation that you spoke about. Okay, that's that's the answer to the, your question. Uh, but yeah. Yes, yeah, maybe it's a, it's a stupid comment, and I'm not sure I yeah. believe in what I'm going to say. But if it's connected to three bots, then the near critical regime is actually uh, you can express it fairly easily in terms of the critical one, <coughs> yeah. just weighted by uh, e to the. Absolutely, absolutely. I was just trying to translate that direction into the direction that he spoke about. But hundred uh, percent, okay, that's that's exactly yes. Very yeah, well. Yeah, I apologize. That's the down to earth question. So, if I think about the spin correlations in the in the in these model, yeah. the, the thing we did, so we did it not through SLEs originally, at least, uh, but through this certain imaging that, that you mentioned. Yeah. Do you expect that in the tricritical case, the results are a kind of isomonodromic deformation philosophy that leads to an appropriate isomonodromic top? Uh, so. Uh I believe I could answer this question in a, in a limited amount of time. There, you know, you would replace the equation d bar of g equals zero by d bar of g equals something, and hopefully that something is a multiple of g or a related cousin of g. Okay, so uh, I, I believe you could like try. If it was to a multiple of g. It would be just the massive <coughs> zero, and it would be just the massive perturbation. Already. Yeah, but with a different, uh, you know, with different settings. So I think you could believe that this would be something. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, okay, there is no chance that d bar of g is still zero, agreed. <laughs> so uh, now, 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 now d bar of g is probably something. Of course, you are speaking about this, uh, this uh, disorder insertion side. Yeah. Uh, this, this is again pretty much uh, the isomodromic deformation philosophy. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's, the, that's where I come from, right? <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Other questions? Yes. I just wanted to make sure that I got something right because yeah. at some point you went re really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have you have a random geometry model coming from from the Fox model, and you have a random geometry model coming from the dense phase of the ON model. Yeah. And on the level of random geometry, do you think that that these two models are exactly the same? But not exactly the lattice level in the scaling, the scaling limit conjecturally. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, 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 the no, 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 I, I mean, okay, <laughs> okay. So let's uh, let's see. So you know, I spoke about. I didn't speak about three pots. You, did you mean to speak about three pots, or you meant to speak about tricritical? No, so for the same kappa, for the same kappa from the from the same kappa. Well, the conjectured scaling limit of the say d d dense O squared of three and uh, of the F K Q equals three. Are conjecturally the same. Okay, that's a, that's okay. The limits of the curves are conjecturally the same. There is no kind of way to distinguish these scaling limits because they are, should be the same. But that's of course conjectural. But, yeah. but why are you surprised? I mean, it sounds a physicist should not be surprised by such a statement. <laughs> 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 Thank you.